the upswing in the, in the virus and the people getting sick, you need to keep on keeping on with the mask and, and just um, play it safe be, and be considerate and uh, just be safe. That's the main thing. Need to remember those that are sick and in trouble that they, uh, whether this pandemic makes us troubled more and uh, we think about things and are scared and just one thing or another. So you may not be physically sick, but in your mind you get sick because you get too nervous and everything. So, but uh, need to remember Brown and his issues, Roosevelt, Henry, uh, Stacy may walk in, in a few minutes. I don't know. So, but uh, it's good to see Aaron and Ramsey here with us today and the kids. Ronnie and Jenny at home and um, Sylvester was here Wednesday night and. Uh, they wouldn't be here today, so hopefully he'll be able to get, get back here soon. So, uh, need to mention that John's mother went through a procedure this past week, and uh, everything was okay, and that was good. Uh, my uh, uh, son's mother-in-law had a little incident this past week and had surgery on her wrist, and she got she owns a muffler shop. The car ran into her, so <laughs> so that was thankful that nothing else happened. So she she's okay. But uh, we just be thankful for all that um, that's going on and everything. I'll have the opening prayer to do the Lord's table, and uh, yeah, we'll get Mike to do the closing prayer. So with all that said, I think I've covered all the announcements. Um, yep, that's it. So just need to remember that um, things are ongoing and that um, we just need to be safe and uh, be uh, just keep it in our minds that way what's going on every day and so and we just make adjustments so now let's bow and we'll have a word of prayer our almighty heavenly father as we come together this morning with the difficulties that we have in this life of ours that we know that uh, these are just a, a small passing things that will come and go we know we put our faith our hope and our trust in you and you are in control of all things and uh, father we look at that we put our burdens on you and we just continue our life and you just tell us that all we need to do is just worship you and be obedient to you and we thank you now for this time that we've gathered together to worship you in truth and spirit and just praising your name father and we thank you for all that you provided for us we ask you now that as uh, we come together that you will remember those that are sick and troubled those that are ailing that for whatever reason that they can't be here that you'll be with them to keep them safe until the next time we meet we know this country is going through some difficulty changes and times and that um, as we go, we know that uh, go through life, Father, we want to live a peaceful life, obedient to you with our fellow man, teaching each other that uh, peace is um, abound through all. Christ teaches peace, understanding, and sitting down and talking with a fellow man. But most of all, Father, be obedient to you and, and teaching your ways. We know this country is a strong country. It will overcome these things. It must be leaders for other nations and uh, countries. And Father, we ask you to keep it strong. And so now, Father, as our leaders are strive for, for the things that would be better for us, we ask you to be with them and let them make laws and, and do things that will be for the betterment of the world. Now, as we study your word, sing praise unto you, Father, we ask you to be with us and forgive us our sins. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody picked up a little cup. Okay. Actually going to be 274A, but I didn't have a little A to put up there on the phone. We're going to sing all three verses. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yeah. 
We've been looking at the world through the eyes of God. And this morning I want to talk about the effects of covetousness. We talked a little bit about covetousness last Sunday uh, in connection with the uh, in connection with the subject of, of gambling. But I want to expand on that a little bit uh, because there are effects of covetousness that we need to, to understand and keep in mind. We need to understand what covetousness is as well as the effects that it has upon our lives and upon the lives of others. Uh, because until we've seen that, we don't really realize how dangerous it is to be covetousness. Well, what is covetousness? Covetousness, as defined by Tyndale Bible Dictionary, is the desire to have something for oneself that belongs to another. A craving or passionate desire. To covet is to desire inordinately to place the object of desire before love and devotion to God. There's nothing wrong with wanting to better oneself financially, nothing wrong with wanting to get uh, a promotion uh, to a higher level of responsibility wherever you may work, nothing wrong with uh, desiring a, a raise. But when a person's desire for things of a physical or material nature uh, reaches the point where he's willing to do anything and stop at nothing to get what he uh, what he wants, that's what we mean by covetousness. That's what is meant by inordinate desire. A, a desire that is out of order. Nothing wrong with desire in itself. But if desire gets the better of us, then we begin to think of ways to fulfill those desires that are not in harmony with God's will, and we simply cannot afford to do that, as we will see. And so, it's the desire to do something for oneself that belongs to another, a craving or passionate desire, to desire in order to place the object of desire before love and devotion to God. I forgot that I had that in there twice. Covetousness is forbidden both in the Old and in the New Testament. In Exodus 20 and verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Nothing wrong with offering somebody money to maybe buy it, maybe you like his car, and you make him a good deal, a good offer, a reasonable offer, and he takes you up on that. Nothing wrong with that. But when that desire for that object, or that person, in the case of this one's spouse, reaches a point where you are willing to do what is whatever you think is necessary, to obtain that, then it's wrong. And uh, especially when it comes to coveting uh, your neighbor's wife, people will break up marriages just so they can marry the, the spouse of someone else. I've known people, and you've probably known people too, who thought they fell in love with somebody who was married to another, and and, and they began to make overtures to that person and entice that person into uh, perhaps a, a life of sin, fornication, etc. And eventually that desire grows so great and it's a mutual desire that the married spouse will divorce uh, his spouse to marry uh, this other one. And that's covetousness, wanting something so bad that you're willing to do anything it takes, whatever it takes, to uh, obtain that. It's also forbidden in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 13, beginning with verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. That's our utmost responsibility to not just our brothers and sisters, but to our neighbors, as, Paul, as Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemy. And so we need to have that best interest of anyone and everyone at heart and do what we can to build one up, to build one another up, rather than to destroy one another's lives. Covetousness leads us to destroy the lives of others and, of course, to destroy our own hope of heaven, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
In verse 9 of Romans 13, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments that God gave Israel can be divided into two sections. They are loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first four commandments. And then the last six commandments have to do with loving your neighbor or your brother as yourself, even your enemy, as Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 22. And so that's really all we owe one another is to love one another. But love will manifest itself in the, in the highest or the best treatment that we can give to another. It will manifest itself in no ill will at all, but nothing but goodwill. We'll share the gospel with those who are lost. We will uh, encourage those who are lacking in spiritual courage. We will go to those whom we feel like have sinned uh, and haven't dealt with that to encourage them to deal with that. And so there are many aspects or many applications we can make of love, but love excludes covetousness just as it excludes adultery, murder, theft, etc. And so all these commandments are summed up you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The only one of the Ten Commandments not binding under the New Covenant is the commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That was a special commandment with reference to the, the relationship between Israel and God because they had been in captivity. He took them out of captivity. They did not have any weekends. They didn't have any two-day weekends, much less a long weekend while they were in subjection there in Egypt. And he had created the heaven and earth and filled it and uh, prepared it for man in six days. And on the seventh day he rested. And so he gave to Israel, when they came over to the promised land, a six-day work week. And they were to rest on the Sabbath day. That was a gift to them. And yet they oftentimes spurned that and sought their own best interest or best material interest in doing things on the Sabbath day that were forbidden. And so remember the Sabbath day. No, we don't have to remember the Sabbath day. We come together on the first day of the week to break bread as a commemoration of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. So what are the effects of covetousness? First of all, Covetousness blunts the sensitive nerve of love. Now, in the material realm, your nerve endings are the millions of points on the surface of your body and inside it which send messages to your brain when you feel sensations such as heat, cold, and pain. Some people say, well, why, is, why does God allow pain? Pain tells us there's something wrong in our body. Pain tells us there's something wrong in our surroundings. You know, if we could not feel pain, if we could not feel the tender uh, touch of a, of a kiss or an embrace. And so these same nerve endings that tell us that there is pain here also tells us that here is uh, a loving kindness that has been demonstrated to us. Here's someone who, who loves me and has embraced me. And demonstrated that love. Well, we are speaking here of love as being sensitive to the needs of others. You pick up on the feelings of others. If you have great sensitivity to your classmates, if you're a student, or your uh, working uh, fellow employees, if you're uh, if you're working, then you're aware of their needs and behave in a way that makes them feel good. Not at the expense of their soul, no. Not feel good in a merely materialistic way, but feel good about themselves and about, uh, about their life. Sometimes we get so despondent about life and we think things are, are far worse than they really are. 
and, and we get to the end of our rope and all we need sometimes is just somebody to, uh, to embrace us and tell us, you know, no, no matter what happens in your life, I love you and God loves you. And I want the best for you and certainly God wants the best for you. And, and if you can just make it through, then you can get to heaven where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more dying. And so when we have this sensitivity to others, it means you consider how others will react to the things that you do. But a person who is covetous, he is not sensitive to the needs of other people. All he is sensitive to is his materialistic desires. And that's all he can think about. Those are the, that's the thing that consumes him. And so covetousness blunts the sensitive nerve of love and makes it impossible for us to really appreciate what another person needs and how to act in such a way as to meet that person's need. In Jude verse 10, and in Jude verses 10 through 13, Jude, who is probably one of the Lord's brothers, he's talking here about false teachers. And he says, but these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. Now here are these Christians to whom Jude is writing, who were falling prey to these false teachers. And they did not really understand the character of these men, and women in some cases, who, whom they were allowing to influence them. These people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. They understand these things instinctively on a lower level, but they have, they have uh, forgotten those things on a practical level. And they no longer operate on those principles that they should have kept uppermost in their minds. He says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Now, Cain, of course, was the first uh, son of Adam and Eve, that is named in Scripture, and he killed his brother Abel because, according to John, 1 John chapter 3, he, his own works were evil and his brother's works were righteous. He was presumably jealous of his brother's right standing with God and he, and he killed him. And so, uh, here were these who were walking in the way of Cain. They did not love those things and those people that they needed to love, they loved only themselves. Balaam was a man who was not an Israelite, but was a prophet of God. Whom he blessed, they were blessed. Whom he cursed, they were cursed. God used him, even though he was not an Israelite. King Balak, as the Israelites were approaching the promised land, King Balak had heard a lot about this people of Israel, how they were just defeating everybody in their path, and he didn't want to have to fight the armies of Israel. And so he hires Balaam to curse them. Balaam told him, well, you know, I can't really curse them unless God allows me to curse them. And he goes to God and asks him for permission to go with these men. God says, don't go. He tells them, I can't, go. I can't even go with you. And they said, well, let's double the bribe. Let's double the amount of money that, that, uh, that we promised you. Well, let me see what more the Lord will say. Then the Lord said, okay, you can go with them, but you don't say anything that I don't authorize you to say. And so he could not curse the people of Israel himself, but he did tell Balak what he needed to do so that God would curse them. And what he did, he told Balak, he said, all you need to do is enter, somehow infiltrate the people of Israel and get them to engage in fornication and idolatry, and God will curse them. And that's what happened. And that's what he's talking about. These false teachers are just like Balaam. They are appealing to the baser nature of those whom they teach. And then it says, and perished in Korah's rebellion. Korah dared to stand up against Moses and Aaron, God's appointed leaders. And he and those who followed him were eventually swallowed up by the earth. 
and that put an end, that put an end to his rebellion. In verse 12, these, still speaking of false teachers, are hidden reefs at your love feasts. Now there is some speculation as to whether these love feasts were just uh, times when they observed the Lord's Supper or times when they came together at, at other times to uh, demonstrate their love to one another. And uh, there's no indication, though, that if it's anything other than the Lord's Supper, that it was anything done in the local assembly. But here they were coming together, they were having these love feasts, and he says, these false teachers are hidden reefs. In other words, it was like a, a reef out there in the sea near the shore that you couldn't see. And if you weren't careful in navigating your boat, uh, you might land on a reef and be stranded on a reef. They're hidden reefs at your love feast. As, as they feast with you without fear, they've got you under control. They've got you because they have appealed to your baser nature and you have allowed that. Shepherds feeding themselves. A shepherd is to feed the flock. But these so-called shepherds, self-appointed shepherds, were feeding themselves at the cost of the flock. Waterless clouds. We've all had seen clouds, and especially times when we, when we need rain, we see a cloud and there's a little hope that we get, get, some, little, get some rain. But then the cloud passes over us and leaves no rain. It was a waterless cloud. It gave us a false hope. That's the way these teachers were. Swept along by the winds. The winds blow that cloud away before it can deposit any rain on our, on our land. Fruitless trees in late autumn. You go to a tree to pick fruit off of it. You go to a, a teacher to get the truth. But they were fruitless where the truth was concerned. Twice dead, two seasons in a row, they were dead and bore no fruit as far as teaching the truth was concerned. Uprooted, God had uprooted them. Trouble is, the people had not uprooted them, and they were still giving them uh, credibility as teachers when they did not need to be or should not have. He said, their wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Here are these false teachers. They are so covetous. They're not, they're not in, in it for you. They're in it for themselves. They don't really care about your spiritual development. They only care about their material gain. That's what covetousness can do. It has blinded the sensitive nerve of love on the part of these false teachers. And if they did not begin to resist the efforts of these false teachers, that same thing would happen to those who are under their spell. Secondly, covetousness, covetousness blurs the picture of life. You know, we've all got, we all grow up, and we've got a, a picture in our mind of, of an idyllic life, you know. What do I want to be when I grow up? And, of course, Roby, as a, as a kid, he always wanted to be a fireman. Uh, well, that may not be the case, I don't know. But at some point, we desire to, to do something, and there's nothing wrong with that. We, we want to pursue some, some career. But when you think about it, that career is only going to last for this life. And we, we can't afford to be so narrow-minded that this, this, this is the only life we can see. There is life after this life that we need to be concerned about. And that's what we're talking about here. When it blurs the picture of life, you see life, material life for something it is not, and fail to see spiritual life and eternal life for what it is. In Colossians 4 verse 14, as Paul is writing to the church of Colossae while he's in prison, he's in prison for two years at the end of the book of Acts. While there, he's, he writes to the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, and he writes to Philemon, who presumably was a preacher for the church of Colossae. But he says toward the end of Colossians 4, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. And so here's this man named Demas, of whom very little is said in Scripture. But he apparently is a, a faithful servant of God, and uh, a helper, a fellow laborer 
with Paul and says, Demas greets you. But later, uh, and, and while he writes at the same time to Philemon, who lived in Colossae, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Now, he doesn't mention some of those into, to the church of Colossae, but he mentions them to, to Philemon, probably because Philemon knew them, even though the rest of the church may not have. But the church knew Demas, and Philemon knew Demas, and he said, Demas, among these others, sends you greetings. Then in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, probably the last of Paul's epistles that have survived. For Demas, in love with this present world, has de deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Paul during the later years of his life, was overseeing the preachers that he had trained, and, and by inspiration, of course, sending them out to, to various areas to preach the gospel. Titus he had sent uh, originally to the island of Crete. And so uh, when you read the, the epistle, his epistle to Titus, you see that Crete is, or that Titus is to Appoint elders in every city there in Crete, every city where there is a church. But he has now called Titus back from Crete to give him another appointment, and he sent uh, Titus now to Dalmatia. Crescens, who not mentioned very much, he sent him to Galatia to labor with the churches of Galatia. But Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas did not go out on an appointment. He did not go out to preach under the oversight of Paul. He loved this present world and deserted Paul, and what's worse, he deserted the Lord, since Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ and inspired by God in his oversight of these younger, younger preachers. What, what, what was the problem there? He saw this world as his only life. It, this world became more valuable to him than life after death. And so he went to a place where he could enjoy life rather than stay on the, on the course where he could enjoy eternal life. In James chapter 4, and verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such in such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. Notice what he says here. Here's where somebody is putting all their effort into a profit here and, and not realizing that you don't know what's going to happen. He goes on in verse 14 and 15. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That doesn't mean that you have to specifically say that every time, but you've got to keep in mind that the Lord may or may not be willing for you to go into this town and spend a year or two there and make profit. Uh, he may be willing for you to see a downfall. He may be willing for you to lose and say in, in the stock market. Maybe that would be in your best interest to lose. Sometimes it is. I like what Homer, I like a lot of things that Homer Haley said. Some things I didn't necessarily, but uh, one thing he said that, that stuck to me is that God always answers prayer. Sometimes he answers yes, sometimes he answers no, and sometimes he says not yet. And so there are times when God is willing to give us the things that we ask for, and there's times he's not willing to give us the things that we ask for. Probably because we don't always know what's in our best spiritual interest. And we need to be, con that's why I think Paul was talking about it in 1 Corinthians 6, when I said again this, this, this morning, that we looked at last week, to be content and not be overly concerned when God does not give us the things that we pray for. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. 
So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. What he's talking about there in James 4, 13 through 16, is saying, I don't have time to do the Lord's will. I've got to go into this town and spend a year or two there and make a profit. That's what's on his mind. That's what's important to him. If you know the right thing to do and fail to do it for you, it is, it is sin. And so, what is he talking about there? He's saying, this life is not all there is. Making material gain in this life is not the most important thing, or should not be the most important thing to you. As we talked about last week, laying up for yourself treasure in heaven, that's the important thing. And that also excludes covetousness, as we, as we noticed uh, last week. Thirdly, covetousness banishes the fruit of generosity. I, I believe it's only natural to be generous. I think kids tend to be generous uh, until such time that that they are that they learn differently from their from their parents. Uh, but we are to be generous. Christians certainly generous with what they have. And as we noticed last week from Ephesians 4.28, the work ethic, work with your hands, the thing which is good, that you may have to give to him that has need. Well, that, uh, covetousness banishes the fruit of generosity. Covetousness prevents me from doing what Paul commanded there in Ephesians 4, verse 28. In Matthew 13, 22, in the parable of the sower, as Jesus is explaining this in the account of Matthew, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Here is an individual. He has become a Christian. He perhaps studies his Bible but he's caught up in the cares of the world, especially the deceitfulness of riches. And that chokes the word. Those things choke the word, and the word proves unfruitful in their lives. And so again, uh, it banishes the fruit of generosity. Uh, when we are so de deceived by riches that we think this is where I need to be focusing my attention. We're wrong about that. And we need to better under, you need to under, we need to understand that. In Luke's account of the same parable, explaining that, he gives us a little more information. And as for what fell among the thorns, there they, those who hear, but they go on their way. They are ch choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. That's what Luke adds to that. And their fruit does not mature. There's nothing wrong with going to Six Flags over Georgia. There's nothing wrong with going to, to Disney World. But we cannot afford to do these things, anything. We cannot afford to experience any of the pleasures of life or seek the pleasures of life at the expense of our relationship to God. God must come first in our lives. And everything else we do when we can and in such a way that it does not interfere with our service to God. Because, you know, when, when we come together, I'm not the only, I should not be the only one benefiting people here. It benefits me as I see people pay close attention uh, to my lesson, and people are paying attention today. I, I can see that. And I, and I appreciate that. So you are an encouragement to me when I'm preaching. I hope that I'm an encouragement to you when I'm preaching. Same thing as when I'm teaching. When we sing the songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, we are teaching and admonishing one another as well as praising God. But when we allow something to interfere with that, then we are putting ourselves ahead of the needs of others. And the fruit of the word will not come to maturity. In 1 John 3, verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? 
Again, Ephesians 4.28. Let him that uh, stole steal no more, rather let him labor, doing with his hands that which is good, that he may have to, uh, to give to him who has need. And so we are not only to be seeking uh, to meet the needs of our ourselves and our loved ones, but to help anybody and everybody. We need to be situating ourselves so that we can do that, at least to some extent. God does not expect us to go in, go in the hock, so to speak. To help somebody, uh, although there may be occasions when that's the thing to do, uh, but not incessantly. And there are people who live their lives in such a way as they overextend themselves repeatedly, and they they build up mountains of debt irresponsibly. Then they come to the church for help, and the church enables them by giving them money. Instead of sitting down and talking with them, say, look, you need to change your lifestyle here. You need to live, live within your means. You brought this upon yourself. Best thing we can do for you is to give you this sound advice. And I've heard where churches nearly emptied their treasuries helping out somebody who had brought his misfortune upon himself. And churches cannot afford to do that not only materially, but spiritually. Fourthly, effects of covetousness. Covetousness breeds the worm of discontent. A person who is, covet, who is covetous is always going to be discontent. He's never going to be contented. As I heard one old preacher say, who's dead now, uh, about another fellow, said he didn't want all the property in the world, he just wanted that which bordered his. And of course that that's going to expand until it fills the whole, the whole world. And so we cannot afford to do that. One who is covetous is and never content with what he has. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, which excludes covetousness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy. His covetousness is that bad. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissensions, slander, evil, suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Some people think that, you know, I'll just use godliness as a means of gain here. I'll just pretend to be godly and, and I'll get uh, money for it as people uh, think I'm helping them, but I'm really not. I'm building up my own, uh, my own material wealth as Judas, who was the keeper of the treasury bag. In 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 3, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. It's easy to appear godly to others. Going through the motions, people will think you're godly. You can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the times. You can't fool all the people all the time, and you can't fool God, fool God any time. We need to get that out of our minds if we think that. We cannot afford to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Love of God should be first, uppermost, and then love of our neighbor, even our enemies, secondary. Philippians 4 verse 11 and Paul is commending the Philippians because they had helped him out time and again when he was in need. And notice what he says here. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. I'm not, I'm not asking you for help. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty 
and hunger, abundance and need. That's, we need to do that. We need to be content with what we have. Yes, pray for an advancement. Pray for a raise. Ask for a raise. Pray for an advance. Uh, promotion. Ask for a promotion. Nothing wrong with those things. As long as we don't make those things the most important things in our lives. Fifth, covetousness burdens the spirit with sorrow. In 1 Timothy 6.10, and we looked at this last week, we won't spend a lot of time on it. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. And so they brought this upon themselves. The love of money, that's what covetousness is. And not just money in the sense of, of coinage and, and paper money, uh, or even the balance of our checkbook or savings account. But anything that is purely material falls under this same head. It's a root of all kinds of evils. And some have pierced themselves with many pains. Sixthly, it blinds the eyes to the beauty of Christ. And when we're talking about the beauty of Christ here, we're talking about not just his personal beauty while he was on earth, but the beauty of Christ as he is in heaven, the beauty of a right relationship with him. And, and so we need to understand that being right with God, especially through his son, Jesus Christ, is or ought to be the single most important things in our lives. In Luke chapter 18, verse 18, a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, I'm not sure why he asked him that. Maybe he wonders why this fellow's calling him good. Maybe, you know, Jesus knew what was on his mind, knew that he thought Jesus was nothing more than a man, a rabbi. Uh, but notice his response to Jesus' answer to this question. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Now Jesus doesn't mention covetousness here, but it is implied by what he says later. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. He's talking about his desire for riches and his willingness or lack thereof to share what he had with others. You cannot be covetous and follow me. You've got to give that up. You've got to give up your love for material things. So sell what you have. And it's, you know, it's funny how people, in, in denying the uh, legitimacy of baptism being essential to salvation, they go to the rich, they go to the, uh, the penitent thief. Well, he didn't have to be baptized. They never go to this ruler who's told to sell all you have and give to the poor. They don't, they don't want to use him as an example. But notice what Jesus said, uh, or what he said in response to this. But when he heard these things, the ruler, he became very sad, but he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. What's the problem here? Those who have wealth oftentimes are not willing to share it. And his heart was not open to the needs of others. That's why he was sad. He couldn't bear the idea of parting with what he had. He thought maybe he could just buy his way into heaven, I guess. Uh, and so... It is difficult for those because of the effects of covetousness. Lastly, it, it blasts the devotee with misery. Matthew, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Covetousness will be the end of one. 
spiritualistic. It will also be the end of one, eternally speaking, if he does not realize that it's inconsistent with the will of God and does not repent of it and get his life right with God. If you need to make your heart right with God, we would encourage you to come while we stand, while we sing. I was sick and deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained with him, singing to your eyes no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair.